Hello, my name is Jared French, and this is a ministry of Barton Baptist Church. Happy you found your way here for one of our opportunities to be ministered to by the Word of God. And uh, this morning, as we gather at church uh, in small groups, we're starting to work on um, test running some of our plans, and so we're gathering. And uh, this video that you're watching now was pre-recorded, but this is the same message and exactly what's going to be recorded, or <laughs> what's being recorded is going to be done live. And so I uh, appreciate that you're connecting with us in this way. And again, we, we do um, extend an invitation to introduce yourself and dive deeper into what God wants to do in your life through being connected to a local church. And so without further ado, let me get to my sermon. We'll be in Acts chapter 22, verses 22 through 29. Acts 22, verses 22 through 29. As you may want to grab a copy of God's Word, I have a few things to say before I read it. Uh, this message, I'm calling it uh, Earthly Rights and Eternity. Earthly Rights and Eternity. Okay, rights. What am I talking about there? Well, like what we read about in the U.S. Declaration of Independence. Uh, this goes like this. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, meaning they can't be taken away or transferred. And then it goes on. What are those unalienable rights? That among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. And he goes in to talk about another right of the people over government. Now, so that's rights. But I said the other part of it's eternity. You know, eternity, like, you know, if you take all the history of all the nations, think about all the ancients, like ancient Egypt, to China, to the Mayans, as far as back we can dig up and, and find things. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 15 says, Look, the nations, right, all their history, who they are, are like a drop in the bucket. Drop in the bucket compared to eternity. Now that's speaking there of the eternal one, which we'll get into. But eternity, forever. And so... Let me put it back to our rights again. Now, our rights, our founding fathers had wisdom to ground the rights of humanity outside themselves. All right? So they're not simply unalienable, but they're alien, not UFO. Alien meaning that they're beyond us. They're from the Creator. And so there's something about that each one of us are, we're, we're created, each one of us are created, and that should lead us to take care on how we put ourselves over top of one of, of another person, right? Another how we're gonna govern over, how we're gonna lead. We need to take care. Be careful. Because there are rights given to each one of us as we're unique, as we're each created with these rights. And so it is good and right to pursue ideals established by rights and the moral laws of nations. The nations of God places us in, right? Then we testify by, by seeking that good and that right, we testify about the hand of God in our creation. Now, so right, now let me uh, step back to eternity. Jesus Christ is the savior of the world because he laid down his rights, his heavenly, godly rights, for the forever good for all those who trust in him. Right? Forever. Eternal, eternal good. He laid down his rights. You can open up Philippians in the New Testament, the letter to the Philippians, chapter 2, and read about that. And so the followers of Jesus are to be like him. And, and as, as, as we're like him, we end up leading others to the forever good that Jesus has for them. You know what? In order to do that, 
to be following Jesus and then in order, in, in order to be something that mirrors and reflects and points people to Jesus, we have to lay down our own lives. Lay down our lives, our definition of, of our lives. As Luke 17, verse 33 points out. Luke 17, verse 33, one of the places. There are many places. But that was one of my favorites when I became a new believer. And so the um, complexity here, there's a bit of a complexity here of our earthly rights and the weight of eternity. In fact, we're going to feel that as we, we unpack our text. We're going to see that in uh, the Apostle Paul. And so without further ado, would you follow along with me? This is the reading of God's word, Acts chapter 22, starting in verse 22. They, this is a crowd in Jerusalem, they listened to him up to this point. They, they raised their voices shouting, wipe this man off the face of the earth. He should not be allowed to live. His right to live should be taken away. As they were yelling and flinging aside their garments, throwing dust up in the air, the commander, now this is a Roman commander, ordered him, Paul, to be brought into the barracks, directing that he be interrogated with the scourge to discover the reason they were shouting against him like this. And as they stretched him out for the lash, right, because the scourge, the, the cat, the cat of nine tails. <laughs> Paul said to the centurion, standing by, Is it legal for you to scourge a man who is a Roman citizen and is uncondemned? Or the centurion standing by. And when the centurion heard this, he went and reported to the commander, saying, What are you going to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. And the commander came and said to him, Tell me, are you a Roman citizen? Yes, he said. And the commander replied, I bought this citizenship for a large amount of money. But I was born a citizen, Paul said. The, the commander, uh, as we'll learn more about, he was a, actually of a Greek nationality. He, he wasn't born in Rome, and so he had to buy his way to be a naturalized citizen. It's kind of interesting uh, practice there. And so he bought it. Paul is not. Paul was born a citizen of the Roman Empire. And so those who were about to examine him withdrew from him immediately. And the commander, too, was alarmed when he realized Paul was a Roman citizen's citizen and, and he had bound him. This is reading of God's word. What did we just read there? Uh, there's a lot going on there, isn't there? Because there's a lot going on around but my topic of this morning um, that I think uh, this text helps us navigate, it's kind of deep, muddy water where some of the best minds in, in church history and history have uh, tried to swim, swim uh, dealing with eternity, eternal good, and our earthly rights. But I'm just going to try to humbly read out this text for us, and, and hopefully you're not screaming at the computer when I'm done. And, and, and throwing garments and, and saying, wipe this man uh, off the face of the planet. <laughs> because as you can see, that's sometimes a response people have for sermons. Now, what did we just read there? I need to get to that, don't I? Well, I think for, etern for the eternal good of others, we need, to be, we need to practice patience with our earthly rights. For the eternal good of others, we need to practice patience with our earthly rights. In other words, if we're practicing patience, it means we're not demanding them and going after them. Okay, and I, I see that in our text. I'll point it out in, in, in three points. Well, that's kind of like the main big idea. But we'll, we'll walk through that in three points. First, we'll look at Jesus' patient Paul. Jesus' patient Paul. And that'll deal with Acts chapter 7, verse 1, uh, through Acts chapter 21 through 21. Or maybe I meant 22 through 21 there. Probably 22. No, yes. Yes. Because then my second point, we're going to zoom into Paul's details that we just read in, in, in 22, chapter 22, verse 22 to 29. So my first point, I want to give you a little more backdrop because you're like, what? In, what, what what's going on? What in the world's going on? There's all these details. 
I'm going to give them to you coming up. So hold on with me. The third point is going to be uh, patience leads to worshiping prisoners. Patience leads to worshiping prisoners. All right, well, I'll repeat those as I go along. And you could always pause me here. But at this point, I'd like to pray. If you would bow your heads with me. Bless me, Father, as we seek to behold more of you, understand you, love you. We do it in these lives that are, are messy and difficult and we have high aspirations for. We, we would love for certain things to happen certain ways. And, and so we, we often deal with ideals and having ideals fall on their face. And so, God, we, we try to make our best efforts <laughs> at some things, and some things we just give up on. And so, God, I think there could be a lot of that going on right now in, in lives. We, we're trying to make our best efforts where we can, and, and some of the things we're just giving up on. And so I pray that this word helps us to kind of refocus, retool our hearts, on the, you may not answer all those questions, but the, 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 see where patience is a, is something just out of this world that you want to give us for these days to help us. And so God, I just pray that you would uh, help the word, your word be opened up to our hearts, that when we come to see and cherish more Jesus, and it's in his name I pray, amen. Now, the first point, uh, Jesus, Jesus is patient Paul. And again, we're going to take in 16 chapters of Acts. So starting in verse 7, and taking in mostly details of chapter 21 and a little bit in chapter 22. And so again, I'm just drawing, dedicating this first point to, to draw that out. And I call it Jesus' patient Paul. Uh, maybe a, a little bit of mouthful there. Uh, when I say patient Paul, I, I'm actually saying that he is a patient person that we're going to be seeing. But it almost sounds like I'm saying that he is, uh, Jesus is patient as in his care. And really, that's true too. Uh, Paul is a patient of Jesus as Jesus is a soul physician. And so either way you take that, Jesus is patient Paul, that's, I, I want to show you just how Paul became Jesus. And so if you've never heard of Paul, maybe you've only heard a little bit about it, um, this is going to be kind of a, a, one of those you know, flashbacks, and, and we're going to take in a lot fairly quickly, but maybe it'll help you if you ever sat down and re read the whole book, whole book of Acts. And so chapter eight, chapter six to eight, we meet Paul in a very similar scene to chapter 22. So in chapter six, the Jerusalem church, so the first church, uh, the, the Jewish believers, they choose seven men to have a, a special assignment. And, and one of them was named Stephen. And their assignment was to serve a particular group of widows. That sounds maybe kind of ordinary, but for many biblical reasons, that's, that's an honor. But something else ends up happening. As, they're, as Stephen is, is going to, to do this task, it seems, or just kind of popping up more, it's like there's miracles happening. And as these miracles are happening around him, it gives him an opportunity to speak more about Jesus. And then that turns into... Some heated debates. Because Stephen was having just such wisdom. And, and, and some of the other people from the Jewish background, they didn't appreciate Stephen talking about Jesus. Claiming Jesus who he was. And so what they did, they dragged him off to stand before the Jewish religious council called the Sanhedrin. And so Acts chapter 7 it is really Stephen opening up 
the entire Bible that they called the Bible at that point, explaining why they're rejecting Jesus from the Bible. And, and you know what? The Sanhedrin and the crowds, they didn't appreciate the sermon. And so, in fact, chapter 7 of Acts, verse 57, it says, They yelled at the top of their voices. They covered their ears. They rushed him. They dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses, because the witnesses in, a, in a, this kind of a court case, if you want to call it that, they're the ones actually the executioner a little bit here too, because they, they, put, they take off their garments and they're going to go stone Stephen. But there's this interesting little detail. Why do we get this detail if, as we keep reading? The, the witnesses' garments are at the feet of a young man named Saul, who will you will come to know as Paul. As you just drop down the next paragraph there in chapter 8, we find out that Paul becomes the chief investigator. He's, the ag he's an agent recognized by the religious, religious authority and somewhat even the government authority. And, and his role was to take away the rights, the right of life. In other words, he, he kind of was able to do some capital punishment. And to who? Specifically believers. Those who believed in Jesus. And so we take a, a, side, a side, some other details are presented to us, and then chapter 9 hits, and, and, and Paul gets a, an untimely visit from the resurrected Jesus Christ. Jesus blinds him and asks him, Why are you persecuting me? And it's kind of a strange question. What, you know, how... Jesus isn't exactly walking around for Paul to be targeting. And what, what Jesus is saying there is those who believe in him, right? he makes one with him. We become one with him. And, and so uh, every believer that, that Paul was persecuting, was killing, was an attack on Jesus. And, and so through that intervention <laughs> by the Lord Jesus Christ, a series of events takes place, and this man who is breathing threats and murder against the followers of Jesus, that's how he's described in, in chapter 8, verse 1, he becomes a man who takes the message and the love, the love of Jesus to the ends of the known world, to the unbelieving, ruthless, pagan world. And in fact, that's what we get in chapters 13 through 21 of Acts, what's often called the three missionary journeys of Paul and his companions. And just to kind of summarize here, I mean, he's preaching, he's explaining from the Old Testament about Jesus. He's engaging the philosophies of the deep thinkers of each culture. He's, he's starting churches, he's strengthening believers and leaders. He's doing this all while getting death threats. Riots are breaking out. He's being stoned nearly to death at one point. He's been beaten with rods. He's been exposed. Meaning take it, the people take him, they took, him, took his clothes. He's been jailed. He's wept over probably the loss of friends and saying goodbyes. Goodbyes. And he's experienced great loneliness. If you want to read 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 20-29, you get his detail there uh, of his whole ministry, really. And but all this, I would say, is looking at that second Corinthians text, all this was in his life to expose his weakness. Mm. Uh, anyone want to sign up for that? Let's pass a sheet around. Can't quite do it online. Uh, make a comment. Uh, put your name in the comment. And, and that once you do that, your name is legally bound that we were going to put you through the Weakness Exposure Program. Sounds like a blast, doesn't it? Why would someone sign up for that? How would that do any good in the world? Well, Paul would answer it. Yeah, through that, he learned the realities of Jesus. As Jesus told him, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9. God uses the, the weak things in this world to shame the strong things. 
And you know what, boy, it was good that Paul was learning that lesson about Jesus because chapter 21 comes. And, and Paul, after the, all that time abroad, he, he, he returns after doing those three journeys. He's really considered equal among the Christian leaders. And the leaders welcomed him, the text tells us, there in chapter 21. And they, they, they hear about all that God is doing among the pagan, ruthless, dirty Gentiles. And chapter 21, verses 20 through 21, we get the reply of the church leaders. Right? Well, what are they going to say to, to Paul's report? Report of, of what God is doing among the nations? Well, I'm going to paraphrase it. This is what they tell Paul. Look at the many thousands of Jews that are coming to believe in Jesus. Now, they're baby Christians, and so they still are jealous for the Old Testament law. And they don't quite understand how the Old Testament law allows you to bring Gentiles to God through Jesus. And so, Paul, you're really messing things up for us here. <laughs> that's, that's a paraphrase, but it kind of hits close. And, and so what they do is they have a plan in verses 22 to 24 to send Paul with four religious, or four Jewish believers. So again, people who have come to know Christ and, and, and uh, from the Jewish background. And these four have completed a religious vow, a religious practice that is found in the Old Testament. There's benefits to it. But the reason why they want Paul to take these guys, it will take them to the temple, Paul. It's going to be quite public. And what they're hoping is they'll see, the Jewish population will see that, that Paul is okay with the Old Testament. Look, he's, he's taking, he's, he's with those guys. Now, you know, Acts 15, this whole issue shouldn't be an issue. And uh, it really seems like maybe the Jerusalem church leaders are jealous over the ministry. You know, like today people compare the size of churches. Ooh, look at that one. Maybe a little jealousy here. It starts early. I mean, and, and, and really, don't they realize all that Paul has been through for the sake of Christ? I mean, if I was in those shoes, good thing I wasn't, I would become quite impatient and agitated at this. But in the text, Paul seemingly agrees with the plan and, and, and goes about doing it. But the Jews see Paul and, and they... They think he's sneaking one of his Gentile friends, right? Someone from a, a non-Jewish background, and, and sneaking them into the holy reserved place for Jews only. You've heard the, the, the expression best laid plans? What happens? Well, in this case, it blew up big time. Big time. And so the, it blows up because they, it's quite public. The city begins to stir, and that means it's coming to a place of rioting. And this is where, again, I've become impatient in my mind as I'm seeing, oh, this is not going to go good. Those church leaders and Jer those Jerusalem church leaders, they're boneheads. Probably lucky if it was only boneheads, right? Just constantly filling my heart. Perfect time for me to be impatient. And it seemed like justly so. And so... In 20 verses, 21, chapter 21, verse 30, the, the Roman soldiers have to intervene. And as they intervene, the, the commander gives permission to, for Paul to give a defense and testimony on, on, on how he becomes Jesus' Paul. And when, when Paul has that permission, he turns to the crowds and speaks Hebrew, the, the Jewish language. And so the, the crowds, what, what happened? They respond, they want to kill him. And so you see like how I started this point, that, that, that chapter, uh, Paul, we first meet him in a very similar uh, situation as we're taking him in chapter 2. It kind of comes full circle to chapter 6 and 7. Now with this background, would you fault Paul from being agitated and impatient? Right? Agitated. I don't know if I'm doing a very good job of showing agitation. Uh, I'm getting to read the words, so I'm not agitated at this moment. <laughs> but, but he's been through so much. I mean, you've been through so much too, right? you got a list. I have a list of all the things I've been through. 
And, and then you, you have to deal with the plans failing, leaders blundering, people stomping on our rights. I mean, Paul had rights as a leader. That should have kept him out of that mess that is, is, is starting. Oh, those Jewish church or those Jerusalem church leaders. It's not the ethnic part. It's, it's those church leaders. And they're so just thinking of themselves. They, they weren't thinking. Uh, they were just thinking about their ministry. And wouldn't we be in our right to be impatient with such a situation? I mean, don't people realize our rights in those situations? Why do they only think about their own? I mean, wouldn't it be better? I mean, I think it'd be better. If we could desert, I mean, we could learn the lessons of Jesus' grace with our rights nice and neatly not touched. Wouldn't that be nice? But let's get to point number two. Point number two is zooming into Paul's patience in the text we read, 22 verses 20 through 29. Hopefully it makes a little more sense now. And whoa, right? That first point, that was a download. That was 16 chapters of hard stuff. But now we're zooming in. Because, and I'm zooming in, doing that intentionally, taking a risk. But, but I hope it, it kind of escalates. Escalates. That, that you see the strangeness and how Paul is conducting himself in, in these verses, 20 through 29 of chapter 22. Right? Looking at all that. I mean, how could a Paul not just start screaming after what just happened in chapter 21? How he was kind of uh, looked down upon and, and, and put in this situation by someone else's, not thinking about their rights, not really thinking about the other person, just caring about themselves. And speaking of rights, let's zoom in. As we, we go into these verses, let's zoom in to Paul's rights. In chapter 22, verse 20 to 24, upon the cries of wipe this person off the earth by the crowds, the, the Romans, the Roman guard, they intervene. Now the Roman guard at this point, they're, they're soldiers. They, they function more like police or SWAT. That's because the Romans have been so effective in, in, uh, in their empire building that there's no, one, no nation really standing against them. And so their soldiers are, are offering more as a police well enforced, please, but please. And you know, Paul, he, he was speaking in Hebrew, right? And, and so the, the Romans, even if they've spent a lot of time here, they, they may have not had an interpreter, or maybe their knowledge of Hebrew just couldn't quite keep up as Paul was unpacking everything he was to the crowds. And, and so they think, wow, we need to investigate Paul. And so in our text, we have a, a, a Roman commander. The, the Greek word there literally means commander of a thousand. And so history has shown us that a Roman commander would have a strength of a thousand men, approximately 760 foot soldiers, and 240 cavalry. And uh, if you go to chapter 23, verse 26, so the next chapter over, we learn the man's name is Claudius Lucius. Claudius Lucius. He's kind of a big dog and... and in that time frame, you can find uh, archaeological evidence of him. And, and, and there in chapter 23, he deals with the Roman governor, the one who's appointed by Rome to be the governor of the region. So he's, he, he's got quite the, the clout. And so he commands Paul, kind of like, I don't know, like a police chief of a big city. He, so he commands Paul to be brought to the barracks, the headquarters of the police station. And so essentially he's handing the situation over, so he rides off into the sunset, uh, to a centurion. Now that word, centurion, means that he's a, a commander of a hundred. And so the centurion is in charge of the transport and investigation. And this investigation means a scourge. That's where you're whipped with a cat of nine tails. Uh, so that, that disturber of the peace, right, because that person just about caused a riot is going to get a, a, a softening with the, the cat o nine tails on their back to get them ready to talk you know soften them up a bit and this is this is the practice for non-roman citizens whether they are 
guilty or innocent. Now, I said that's a non-Roman. A Roman citizen would have a process like we are familiar with, due process. They would have an opportunity to make a defense. They wouldn't immediately get softened up in that way. And so verse 22-24, Paul reveals that he is a Roman citizen. How does he do it? He does it with a question. He, isn't that interesting? He does it with a question. Just, it almost seems like it's like nonchalantly. How are you about to do this? And, and so let's zoom in with me. Okay, we zoomed into the rights. Let's zoom in with the, into the patient that Paul had with his rights. Paul, as a Roman citizen, could have started demanding his rights before the crowd and the commander, right? What, I mean, the, you got the benefit. The top dog is there. But he didn't. He could have mentioned it on the ride over to the police station. Hey, guys, I need my lawyer. And uh, since I'm a Roman citizen, uh, <laughs> I need my lawyer and be able to make a defense. But he didn't. Paul waited until he was stretched out, ready to see those whips on his back. Then he asked the centurion, right, who's a lesser, lesser than the authority. The, the centurion is standing over. There's a kind of a grunt uh, about there to whip him, a punisher. And he asks, is it legal for you to scourge a man who's a Roman citizen and, and is uncondemned, who hasn't been tried? See, Paul is strategic with his constitutional right. He's patient with it. That's because he's, he's truly possessed he, and, and possession and possessed by patience. You see, patience is more alien outside of us than the creator-given rights. Again, we, we, we have those creator-given rights, the, the fingerprints of God on us that the Declaration of Independence is, being, is acknowledging. And that's what our forefathers had the wisdom to define and ground the rights in this this ideal society that they were um, starting, right? The rights of life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. It's not something that they defined on paper. It's something they observed that was true of created beings. No, they weren't perfect at executing it. But that's like anything. They at least had the wisdom and probably the hand of God moving them to put that down as a start. But see, patience is not... It, patience is beyond fingerprints of God. And I think sometimes we take that for granted. See, Galatians 5, Galatians, a New Testament letter, Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23. We read there, but the fruit of the Spirit, now you notice that that's fruit, singular. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The fruit of the Spirit, I mean, the the spirit working in a person's life produces these things. But while it's still it's the spirit working, it, it's still not just this thing that kind of boop, and here's a fruit. <laughs> there, there's a process, right? Because you know, like fruits, there's this whole germination, pollination process, and it has to have the you know, right connection to the vine. And that's in fact where Jesus points. He says in and John, record for us in John 15, 5, Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. So Jesus is the big part, the part that get, goes into the, the water, that sends the nutrients out to the, the branches. And he says, the one who remains in me and I in him produces much fruit. Because you can do nothing without me. See, patience for things in this life it doesn't have to be just rights for anything. Patience for those things in this life comes only when we receive something greater in and from Jesus. The other thing that, that like, we, we think that patience is really stubbornness, which is a sermon from another day. I'm really going to hone in on patience. And so, um, see, the, the circumstances that seem perfect reason for me to blow up or become impatient is really a place in my weakness, in my weakness, the fact that I can't do this, that I can receive more of Jesus. I can receive more of Jesus and, and see his strength 
coming out of me. And that, when that his strength coming out of me, then that's, that's what we call patience. But it's because our eyes are set on Jesus. We're wanting more from him. We're, we're clinging to him that that patience for this other thing comes out of us. And so I believe Paul, right, he, sometimes when we think patience, it, we, we kind of we start making tick marks. We, we try to record it. I mean, I've been patient this long. Look, God, five days. I've waited five days. I've waited two months. God, when's this going to change? No, see, what, what, and then what, what, then we add to that, we're like, oh, look, there's a sign. There's an open door. Uh, uh, something just dropped out of the sky, right? We think, okay, now God wants us to go ahead and move on. Now, you see, what, what's going on with Paul is, is in this moment, he has clung to Christ more than his rights. Clung to Christ more than his rights. And as he did so, he, he took his eyes off himself. And in that moment, he could see that there might be ways that he could turn this around, right? By faith and honestly by the strength of Christ working through. But, but again, God's working in our hearts. And so as, as Paul, as this spiritual activity is going out and coming out of me, he, he said, hey, this could turn around. For the eternal good, the forever good of my neighbor, who happened to be captors, uh, jailers, the godless Roman soldiers. So he uses his rights strategically. And you know what? He starts with the lowly punisher and a centurion. He starts with the lowly. Sounds kind of familiar. But then he does. He uses his rights. Don't hear me in this sermon. Any point says he doesn't use his Roman rights. He escalates back, it escalates back to the commander. And in fact, the, the, as at the, the book of Acts ends, this then goes to a governor, the Roman governor. It goes to these kind of a lower kings and queens, king and queen, king and queen pair. And then it goes all the way to Caesar and Rome. Now, we don't ever hear the, the, the final results of how Caesar uh, declares the, this case. It, it, but, it, but we are told that it takes two years in Acts chapter 28. It takes two years that Paul is there, considered to be in this kind of state of waiting for his, his date, his court case. And as a Roman citizen, he didn't have to sit in jail. He had uh, the, the finances that he could rent a house and be under house arrest. House arrest, but it's, it's interesting. Acts 28, the last verses in Acts 20, verse 31, it tells us that he was proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Without hindrance hindrance. You get that? Everything that we think is a hindrance, he, see, there, there's no hindrance for him, right? Because he's patiently waiting for earthly rights and justice. He's patiently waiting. Meanwhile, he's doing the eternal good for others because he's connected to the vine. He's connected to, to Jesus. And so he is without, without hindrance. Wow. So from that, wow, let's move to point three. Point three. Patience leads to worshiping prisoners. My, again, my kind of main point is what I said, is for the eternal good, we need to practice patience with our earthly rights. And patience it is kind of a process more than a, a one thing. It eventually comes out. Again, it's a process that we engage in and and. and not by work of our own, but because of Jesus working inside us, poof, then, then that, that fruit germinates and grows. The fruit of patience is seen in our life. <clears throat> and so patience is the process of taking our eyes off our earthly situations and, and rights. Not that those are bad things, not to say that we can't um, still keep them, because God's placed us here for a reason. So those things matter. But what we do is we cry out to Jesus saying, Jesus, sustain me because this is tugging on my heart more than you right now. Right? This, this is getting my, my thoughts. This is getting my cycles. I mean, I'm a, I'm a thinker. And so um, that's something that, that I have to do more often than not because there's just like keep wanting to turn things around, analyze it. 
but everyone goes to that to some degree, right? That it's, because it's not just here, because it's here in our hearts. It's our waking thought. And so Jesus sustained me because this is tugging on my heart right now more than you. And I'm tempted to grab onto anything that promises to, to, to put me a step closer to getting that desire. Or you know what? I'm going to blow up at the next thing that keeps me from it. And really, to be honest, God, I cry out to you, God, through the name of Jesus, to be honest, I'm not patient in this moment. So help me. Help me trust in your promises. May I trade these earthly longings for, yes, these good things, but may I trade them for faith in my relationship with you. And may that occupy my heart. You see, the cry, the fight, is patience. And what it does is it leads, right, th- th- that process leads to patience as Jesus meets us, and then it leads us to a place of worship where we praise him. Right? We praise him through the storm as the song goes. We praise him through the storm as we, we're processing that. Uh, Jesus, I know you can meet me. I know you can meet me. And then it just continues and, and, and grows us into worship. And so that's why I like the, my third point. I labeled it, patience leads to worshiping prisoners. Because this is my attempt to apply this to our current time. Now, I hope I've been very clear that creator-given rights, the Bill of Rights, constitutional principles, conscience, are realms for Christians, for all people. Really? And, and again, and that's why Christians are there, because we don't check out of this world. And, and again, and, and I hope I never reflected that Paul somehow, eh, who cares about rights? And so I completely understand that there is a, um, there's a lot going on right now. <laughs> there's, there's the whole health situation that, that causes a lot of fear. But then there's a lot of passion and agitation over what's going on with the constitutional principles, the Bill of Rights, the God-given given rights, and the conscience. And, and I understand. And I, probably someone's going to be mad at me because they hear me talking more about one side of that equation than the other because right, you can't be concerned about the health and also concerned about the Constitution. And, uh, someone's going to be mad at you and, and right, they're going to close their ears. They're going to have to... <laughs> The other garments, wipe that guy off the, the face of the internet. Don't let him back on. Who knows? It could happen too. Um, but what I, my, my plea, my, my urging here is I, I'm trying to move you to where you'll seek more patience from above than those things. Wisdom to act not in a short run, but a long, eternal run. And I, I particularly beg to the group that that's concerned about constitutional uh, the constitutional situation, and, and that's the camp that I'm probably lean more towards. Uh, I beg you not to make this a God versus Governor J.B. Prickster or, or some other elected official. Yes, we are children of God, and, and yes, that gives us certain rights and, and in worship, and we don't need the government's permission to worship. But I get all that. But you know what, Christian? In demanding our rights as children of God, we're fringing on sounding like spoiled children, spoiled brats. Do you want to sound like that? I hope the answer is no. And I hope that continue to kind of push you that way with what I want to do next. I want to give you a new picture for our time in light of this text. A new picture. A new picture for this exercise that we're calling shelter in place as executed by the government of Illinois with the power of the sword. Right? As recognized by says, as recognized by scripture. It's a government placed in power by God that has a sword, has responsibility. Now, we may believe it's an unjust usage. And uh, again, not to negate that the, 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 the there was something appropriate on many levels to, to, to address a health concern COVID-19 but so but still but again back to the one group that I'm thinking more likely to be listening to me may have just turned off but 
ta talking to you, like, yes, there's an unjust usage to the power uh, of the state right now. And, and please, ap appeal. Go to other elected officials. Uh, do peaceful pr protests. Vote, etc. But as you do so, please, I want you to do a little more than just that on the surface. And maybe it, maybe it season and, and, and season what you're doing there. Get the, get the shaker up. Shh, shh, shh. Season what you're doing there. The new picture I want to give you is we've been and still are under house arrest. And we have Warden JB. Warden JB. Uh, the likenesses of this illustration are intentional, but <laughs> the names haven't been changed. Uh, so we have Warden G JB, and, and you know, he's issued work passes, lots of them, and yet not enough of them either because it's causing a lot of pain for a lot of households. So lots of them, there's so many holes in, in the, the plan that there's so many people going out, but it's him, he's the warden. I'm not saying, oh, I am saying some things, but he's the warden. He's handed out work passes to the, his prisoners. And he's, he's also said okay to certain activities, like going to the grocery store, hardware store. And he also has a dress code, right? He has a dress code that we, we have, right? I'm, Completely accurate for a prison situation. And in fact, if this were a full-blown prison, you as a Christian would have an opportunity to worship at times as a group, wouldn't you? They've had chapel. But that is dependent upon the warden's assessment of the state of the prison. Are there riots going on? What is the health, right? Because even under normal circumstances, imagine having that many people, a warden of a prison has to keep tabs on what is going on in the flu seasons. And so, if things are off, no groups are going to have any activities. And so, uh, let me lean into that, right? The, the warden is not singling out a single group when he's doing that. He's treating them all the same. He doesn't care what attributes they have uh, next to them. Because he, he, he doesn't find maybe one, you know, like the, the, the Christian, Christian activity any more dangerous but he needs to shut them all down. Right? He's taking this approach of locking down all the prisoners because it's, it's, uh, he's, wanting to, he's wanting to minimize, if I can get that out, a perceived threat with minimum risk. And he, the reason he's doing that, because, well, no, he, he wants to minimize. Now, that picture could make your blood boil. I understand that. There, there's injustice to be under house arrest. Uh, when you're not guilty. Uh, and, and that's okay. But again, I'm trying to move into the more. More. Let's go beyond. Because as a Christian prisoner, you should think of Acts 22, right? Paul's a prisoner right here. He's stretched out as a prisoner. He's, he's, he hasn't been tried. Or how about Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 24? He's in chains in a cell. You might be familiar with that text. If you're not, it's... Uh, Similar scene in some regards. Maybe a, a little smaller jail. Maybe like going in the Bartonville jail versus this is the... Acts 22 is kind of like the big house. And so if the current warden, let's say he was our Roman with that whip, our centurion or our Philippian jailer, would he see enough work of Jesus in us as we're responding to our situations? Would there be enough in how we're talking and how we're posting things and how we're protesting and how we're calling up other people would there be enough in how we're seasoning our language to point him to jesus christian that should give you pause it gives me a pause you know even if we're, we're right about our rights or in le legality i think as christians we need to look at this these challenges in the executive order as cells and chains. And you know what? And as Christians, we, as we, we go and lean into what the Scripture has showed us, what, what Christians have gone through before, how the Spirit works, we can continue to worship God without limits. Understand that? With chains and cells around us, walls. We can continue to worship God in spirit without limit while our bodies, do, they, they still do feel that weight. They feel the limitation. 
But you know what? We can still lift our hands. That's my attempt to make chain noise. Uh, lift our hands. Right? Maybe it's not as high, but we can still lift up our hands and sing, lift up our voices to God and worship. The reason why we can do that, the reason why Paul did that in, in Acts 16, and particularly I have in view, is because he had a bigger picture, and we can have a bigger picture of a view of it as spending eternity, eternity with God. Because of what Christ has done. Eternity with God is what Christ has done. And so this imprisonment, this time, is rather short in light of eternity. And so we can start celebrating that. We can sing Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. No, this is, it's not easy to get there. It's a fight. It's a process. What I've tried to lay out in my kind of way of... Uh, of uh, showing what patience is. And it's, again, it's hard. It's a process to work through. Our rights are being st stomped. Uh, the information from all sides of this is kind of confusing. Uh, we're missing out on things. Or we feel like we're missing out on things. Or our future is seen like it's going to be hindered. We start listening to all those things, but we kind of forget that eternity is untouched. Eternity is long. Eternity is where our best life is. I appreciate uh, there's a Christian rapper and he's, he was a pastor. Um, he made the statement, if you're, if you're living your best, best life now, you're probably going to hell. This isn't where God designed our best life to be. His name's Shia Lin, if you happen to want to look him up, Shia Lin. Um, it's quite powerful, but it's quite biblical. It doesn't mean that this isn't a, there's not good in this life. But we, we, we see, we, we get more of that good by actually leaning into crying out to Jesus. Help us be patient. Help us to, to see what you're doing here and, and, and start working even through these imperfect, difficult situations for someone else's good. Because from the testimony of Acts chapter, chapter 16, chapter 22, chapter 28, this, as this is going on in a Christian heart, this is what brings the light of the gospel in some very dark places and, and situations. It's where prison wardens lose their spiritual chains of, of sin and death and find freedom in Jesus Christ. Perhaps you need to think about this situation. Who's your warden? Who's your Philippian jailer? So in conclusion, let me pose it as a question. Could you be helped by crying out to Jesus in these days? I'm not saying that you're not a believer. But as a believer, sometimes we forget that we need to cry out to Jesus. To help us not focus on the, the earthly rights being denied or delayed. But focus on the, those eternal promises of God and Jesus Christ that are present today. And that are only going to continue to grow brighter and brighter in each day as we lean into it and, and, and see more of the spiritual fruit come out of us. So cry out, cling to Jesus, and may the fruit of patience be in your life. And may it give you wisdom to do eternal good for others, even those who may be your punishers and jailers. With that, let me pray. Let's say, Father, we, we thank you that your word comes to us from a perfect God. You're a perfect God. Uh, we have a, a, a sinless Savior who became sin to, to bring us near to God, to take away our sin. We're dealing with perfection. We're dealing with holiness there. And yet it's applied to, to life. Messy, dirty, muddy situations. You lift us out of, out of that. I mean, we're still living in this world, but we, you lift our eyes up out of that to see how you're still working here. You're not done yet. You're still working. And you want to use us, not by placing us on some cloud to float on and just ease through everything, but that 
you're, we see more how you're defining us and, and redefining us from the heart, from the inside out, by going through these trials. That we actually get to see more of Jesus in our lives and, 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 and how it's woven into us. He saves us and He remakes us. And so God, I pray that as we apply this patience lesson to a particular situation with COVID-19, that we don't miss that it's true also in marriages. It's, it's devastating to marriages when, when spouses demand their rights. That it can be so much more powerful as a spouse, instead of keep demanding from their, their, their spouse, says, oh, you know what, I'm probably looking for you to do something that only God can do for me. And that's why you give us each other, actually to point one another to God, but there's sometimes we lower our sights and we, and, and we, we think the other person's going to give us something that we want when we really needed you. And that shows up in many relationships, from parent-child to friendships. So God, we, we so often just want to demand our rights and we think once we get our rights, everything will go fine. Or once people acknowledge this is what should be in my life. But greater than that, it's not just the creator given rights, it's the creator being in our life. And that's what you desire. That's what you've designed everything to point to. And so may we stop clinging to our rights while they're good and while they're from you, but may we cling to you. May the cross, what Jesus did there, help us loosen our grip on our rights. So that way our, our hands are honestly open for what you want to give us. So God, I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, have a blessed day, and I, I look forward to connecting with you either via this or uh, that we tune in again, but i really like to hear an email from you, and, and especially if you're in the Bartonville area, uh, sorry, uh, to connect with you. So we'll see you next time.